before it got hit by lightning, lost its chip, uh, <laughs> hydraulics didn't work. We got a different excuse out every day. <laughs> and as soon as we were supposed to go to Coco Cay, it went to a place to uh, tender or whatever, and then they did this cancel. We high-tailed it up to the door clock. Because we knew that was the next place going to get crashed. And we got on the first group that was actually able to go. we got on the first group. Did you watch it over the side? You know, or I'm never going up again. It went over the side. It was windy as hell up there. Well, it was windy as all hell that morning. So I was not a happy camper. I don't like high camping. So I believe a, just a few of you are here for the 270 Technology Tour. Thank you very much. So you'll have to forgive us, this is the first time we're doing this, so it might be a little bit unrehearsed. Uh, what we would usually do is try and bring in various Vistarama things for you to look at, but since it's such a lovely day, then we don't want to block out the rest of the view. So what we're going to do is give an overview of who we are and what we do within the venue, and then open it up to questions. and try and answer anything that may have been bugging you regarding the shows or the technology that we have in here. So to start off, my name's Jack McLean, I'm from Scotland, I'm the stage and production manager for 270, and it's my main responsibility to run the production shows and this venue on a day-to-day -day basis. So I base myself all the way up in that glass booth where most of the monitors are, and I run the show from there along with a team of sound technicians, rigging specialists, light technicians, stage staff, dancers, singers, and that's how we bring together the performance and the show that is Star Water. My main responsibility for the show is running those six robots. So I'm the person who moves them in and out and makes them do what they do on an everyday basis. I'm the only person on the ship who is trained and allowed to do so. So every time you see them move, I'm always sitting up in that booth making it happen. Okay, I'll pass it on to Bruce, our sound technician. Hi, my name is Bruce Wiggins. Um, from Scotland as well. I'm the sound technician in 270. Um, this venue is massively different to any other venue sound-wise um, in the Royal Caribbean fleet. The way that the equipment is all connected together is a whole new concept. So I was the first person to kind of get my hands on this venue in the company. So right now I'm the only person that knows how this venue operates in the fleet other than the systems designer. Um, my main responsibility in this venue is to make everything loud. So the singers uh, and the playback tracks for the show, that's my main responsibility. Obviously, to maintain the equipment as well. I shall pass you on to Dorian, the lovely rigger. Thank you. My name is Dorian Robinson. I'm from the US, from Oregon. I'm the rigging specialist in the venue. I run the shows from up over there in that corner. You can see a computer monitor. Uh, my responsibilities as rigging specialist are performer flying. So anytime you see somebody hanging from somewhere in the sky or the silks that are in the show, uh, that's me making that happen with another team of uh, riggers and stage staff up in the grid. Uh, yes, Eric. My name is uh, Eric Wisniewski. I am from the United States. I currently live in New York City. And I am the lighting technician here on board uh, in 270. I'm responsible for operating all of the lights that are installed here and maintaining the equipment. Uh, most of it's relatively new, so thankfully we don't have too many issues yet. But uh, if anything arises, it's uh, my responsibility to make sure that it works and uh, keep it running for the shows. Hello, my name is Javier. I'm the dance captain for the 270 cast. My responsibility, along with the vocal captain, is to make sure that the show's integrity remains intact. Uh, Moment Factory and Royal Caribbean Productions created um, Star Water, and that's a uh, first um, for the ship and for this class, and we are very, very lucky to be here. Hello, my name is Eileen Vargas Sanders. I am from the U.S. I live in Tampa, Florida. Um, as Javier said, um, as the vocal captain, one of the thing, one of my responsibilities is to maintain the show the way that they saw it the very first time, to maintain the vocals throughout. And my other responsibility is to stand here and let him fly me. 
up into there and then run around to come down here and reappear. <laughs> As you can see, these are the, the five main people in the venue who make all of this possible. So what I'll do is I'll give you an overview of everything that we have here, and by raise of hands or applause, who has actually seen Starwater thus far? Good. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. It is a very unique show. It's something that's never been done before in terms of the technology and the partnership that we have. As Javier mentioned, Royal Caribbean Productions in partnership with Moment Factory, created the show that is Star Water. So, what we're standing on at the moment is our, is our dance stage. So it varies from where you see the piano here, all the way across this wooden floor, to where you see the guests sitting over there. You have runway left here, the outer ring, the turntable, runway right. All of this has the capability to come up to flush with this level. As you saw during the opening sequence, it comes up, it comes down, it moves about, and then the inner circle has the ability to rotate an infinite number of times as well. You'll notice that we don't have a backstage area, which makes it very difficult to do these shows. So where the piano goes and where all the furniture goes is actually downstairs. It's not an overly large area, but it's very well designed. We were quite lucky that the people who designed this ship were theatre-based people. So they gave a very big helping hand in the layout of it. Actually, it's a very large, a small-ish area that runs behind, underneath where all of these chairs are, and that allows us to store the piano, all of our set pieces, and a lot of the furniture that you see. The ship is, well, this room is designed as the living room of the ship, is what they like to call it. So you can come in at any point during the day, sit anywhere you like, any person is welcome to play the piano, and then at night, in the space of about an hour, we're able to transform it from this mass open view into a, a theater as such. If you look above us as well, this is our performer flying <coughs> area. So everywhere that you see one of these lights hung, there's actually a walkway above there as well. So that's how our performers get between things. Anywhere you don't see uh, a light hung or any of the curtains are, that is an open space where we close them during the day, but you can see that we have projectors up there the three main projectors that do the, the skirt projection. Then we have our 18 projectors that are hidden from your view that allow us to project onto the Vistarama. Couple that with the six robot screens and that's how we bring together the show. There's a lot of equipment in here and it does take a long time. It took us about five or six weeks to get everything from completely as it is to creating a show to programming the show and then running it and running it, so you see the flawless production that is Star Water. Obviously, we come into a few technical issues here and there, but it's things that you're going to deal with. It doesn't matter if you're on a ship or if you're on land or you're anywhere else in the world. These are just things that happen. The first performance of the week, we had an issue with the projectors, and so we ran the show without Vistarama. It's the first time we've ever had to do that, but it was a good learning curve for us because we found out that the dancers, a lot of the light that comes from it, helps them see on the dance floor. So now we're trying to program a secondary version of the show that will run if this drama ever goes down again. We made the decision to remove it because you could either have half of it or none of it. So would you rather see the show with a massive flat spot in the middle or would you rather see it without anything so you, know, you don't necessarily know that something's missing? These are the decisions that we make we have a version of the show which does not include the robots as well, because again, they're an electrical component and anything can happen to them. So that's how we do what we do. It takes about 45 minutes for us to turn it from what you're sitting in now to a venue that's capable of running a production show. That involves taking all of the furniture from the upstage area, removing it and blocking off the area, bringing in the Vistarama, turning on all of our projectors, turning on the robots, doing our test sequences, sound, lights, dancers warming up, and about an hour, and we would be able to do a show in here. It's not very easy to go from that. It takes a team of about nine people to move everything around quickly enough and store it properly, so we're able to do that, and the checks that we have to do are done because we need to power everything up and run through a few maintenance tests to make sure that it is all safe and good to use, and then the dancers obviously come to us with any concerns prior to the show, and we fix them there and then. 
I'll pass you on to anybody else who would like to talk, give an overview. Or would we like to open it up to questions and answers? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about the show? Yes, I noticed the other night during the performance there were dancers down here on the stage dancing, and at the same time they appeared on screens. Is that the Vista Rama that you were? Okay. Can you explain in, say, two, three minutes how that's done? Well, um, that's a great question. Uh, there was about six of us that were lucky to begin rehearsals mid-August, and we went first to Hollywood, Florida, where we have Royal Caribbean Production Studios. And we were rehearsing for about a week and a half, and then we traveled to Montreal, which is the home base city for Moment Factory, who created all the digital content. And we filmed, it was a blue screen, kind of like they do in the movies for all the special effects. So we, are, we have the choreo, and we have the costumes. We filmed, it was just one day, but it was like 16 hours. And that's what you see um, in, the, in the show. So it's um, six of the 16 cast members we are featured in the, in the screens and the robots. And they'll be on the ship for eight years. <laughs> So yeah, uh, when Moment Factory created the show, all of the content that you see displayed on that Vistarama surface is custom made. It is, uh, I think somebody said it comes in at $60,000 per minute. So you can imagine the extent of the cost. And then Javier and the rest of the cast that were used were superimposed on that image. So for the four weeks that we were in Germany prior to bringing our crossing over here, where you see that nice, lovely library up there was filled with MacBooks, computers, and was basically an entire render farm where they were updating content on a daily basis and we would test it the next day. They would do night shifts, we would do day shifts where we would program the show and test it. And when we were ready to get into it, they would make small changes all the way up until maybe two weeks ago. Yeah, probably about 14 days ago now is when Moment Factory officially, officially left the ship and we have the full version of Star Wars that everybody is happy with. Can I say something? That it was nerve-wracking the very first time um, the, the entire cast was, we were sitting right there where you are, and we were watching the whole thing. So we film, but we don't get to say what they put on the screen, right? So this is me, 20 feet tall now, and I'm nervous. And I, I'm excited for my mom to come see it, because she'll finally see that I'm tall. But, <laughs> Um, it was it was very interesting and like Jack said every day was changing and it, it kept getting more intricate and there were more couples like I think it's like 50 couples out of four people I mean four couples so it's it's kind of scary but it's at the same time it's beautiful it's beautiful art. Sorry, as I said, quite unrehearsed. Uh, what do you do if somebody gets injured? Do you have fall of under studies? The the cast right now, luckily no one's been injured. Um, we are we are um, prepared to have understudy for certain roles. For example, the Muse, which is played by Eileen, we have an understudy who is one of the singers, Jacqueline. For the main couple, we have two, two main couples that are on a rotation. For every voyage, they switch. Um, and there's also a third couple, myself and Cassie, who are the understudy couple for them. So we're covered in that sense. For the aerialist, um, we have three guys doing two um, roles in the, in the human puppets, which is what we call them. And as far as dancers, we don't have other dancers that can cover us. So if somebody's either sick or injured, uh, we go into what we call a reblock, which it can mean that I remove a couple or um, I switch them around so that the space um, looks full um, so that you don't notice that we're missing someone. How is for you? Uh, your gal when you're entering this gorgeous uh, building that is a fabulous ladder. But there's more fabric in that than the parachute. <laughs> How in the world do you get all that tag or How do they get all that tag in your gal? Well, um, for tomorrow's show, I'll probably start at about 6 tonight to get prepared. Um, because it takes that long, though. It's, it's a, it is, it's a lot of fabric. I think, I'm trying to think of the dimensions. Um, I think it's 72 feet, I'm making that up, I'm not sure. It's a lot of fabric and the way that they have it, um, we went through one of the things that Moment Factory did prior to even getting to us, because they had the concept in mind for 
like two years prior to us even being chosen, the cast being chosen. So they workshopped that skirt a lot. And then when we got into rehearsal in September, we workshopped it as well, how to fold it, different ways of folding it so that it'd be easy for the dancers to pull it out. So the final is a very intricate um, Venetian blind kabuki type of, of way and it's released in the back and then the dancers um, they unfurl it and the projections and then there's a point where I untie it, which I try to do very discreetly, but it doesn't work out half the time. I'm like, this just to untie it so that it, so that it will release, but it's, it's very, very, very heavy. Um, it's a lot of fabric. I'm sure that when all is said and done, the dress and then the skirt, because I have a dress on, I have a harness on, then I have on the dress and then the skirt is attached to the dress, and then there's another dress on top of it. And so I believe it, it probably weighs uh, well over 30 pounds, so it's a lot, it's a lot of fabric, and it's, there have been a lot of design changes over time to turn into, into what it is now. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty big prep for me downstairs while everybody is up here doing all the vote flashes. I'm getting dressed and pulling on all my accoutrements to get ready. So it, it is a lot of, um, it's a lot of fabric, a lot of fabric. Would you tell me again about the part where you take all the fabric off? And I, I don't know how that happened, but it, the whole thing was very easy. Uh, the magic. It was a lot of trial and error, I have to say. We were in, in the studios rehearsing. I, I think we had like four different ways of folding the skirt used to be pouches. Um, I mean, literally three, four hours a day dedicated to the skirt. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, the way that it ends up being, it's a, uh, the way that it's attached, it's a little bit of fishing line, a little bit of um, parachute cord, and some boning, and some hook and eye. So there's a lot of things going on, there's some rings and some rope. So there's a lot of things going on so that when the dancers unfurl it, it just looks like it, you know, it's like a Venetian blonde, the way that it comes out. And then they hook it so that those pieces, there are three pieces, so that those pieces go up into the air and then there's a release. So and it's- There's a little bit of magic, right? You have the dancers, we're moving, and then you have one dancer behind her that is undoing it. Well, you don't notice because you have 12 other dancers around. <laughs> That's, that's the magic in there. Okay, next question over beside the piano. <coughs> uh, this is for the audio gentlemen. What are some of the uh, things that make the audio system in here so special and unique? Um, it's just really the speaker placement. Uh, what most of you won't know is that the final design, the, the speaker hangs we actually have here, are the third choice. Originally, uh, there was a line array system in here, so we had three, li three line arrays spread across the front. Um, unfortunately, it didn't quite work for the space in terms of where they were hung. So they had to move stuff around, and we decided that the, the replacements weren't good enough, so we eventually settled on these. Um, and so the rest of the speaker placements start to play a massive part. What you can't see is actually up here behind these blinds, is a whole system of speakers. Um, and it, it kind of fills the whole space. If you think of it maybe self as like a 5.1 surround system, so we have the ability to place sound very precisely in this room. So during the show, I know the sound designer used the system to its full potential. You know, you have a very different experience in this room if you sit here, if you sit in the balcony, under the balcony, even over to the left and the right you actually have uh, quite a varying experience sound-wise. Um, I, I really personally think in this whole front area here is where you're going to have the full experience. If you sit elsewhere, it's not going to detract from the performance, but I really think the way he used the ceiling and the surround and the main system, um, this for me is, is the best location really if you want to hear all the, a lot of the intricate parts. and. Being able to do that in a show, even for regular things, you know, we can we can pretty much do anything. It's it's a very very nice system and it's it's very unique. Um, yeah, I, really, if we could remove these, you could see everything properly. You can see, you know, there's like a couple here. There's more under here. 
there's it's, it's a massive system when you when you look at it completely. It's it's huge and it, it offers us massive flexibility in order to to recreate sound. It's, I love it. It's, it's one of my favourite systems on a ship. First, we'd like to thank you for a fabulous show. Um, <laughs> my, my question's for the dancers. When we were in the transatlantic, we had to happen to see you uh, warming up or whatever once. We were exhausted watching you. How frequent do you have to exercise or whatever to stay in shape for this show? Um, maybe you can handle with this one since you're the flying specialist, rigging specialist. Um, for the <coughs> aerial that we do on ships, it's designated that once a week we have to have an aerial strengthening and conditioning. So that is perhaps what you saw. We'll set up a crash mat on the ground, um, a rope so that they can practice climbing up and down, building up those uh, core muscles, those arms, and then a hoop as well that goes right over this lift so they can do pull-ups, bluebirds. So it's a minimum of once a week. And in addition to that, these guys are in the gym all of the time. Not all the time, sometimes. Um, Royal Caribbean has, uh, for my experience, I've been with them for about four years. They gave me this opportunity to be an aerialist. I, I'm originally a dancer, and that's all I ever did. When I first came to the company, there was an opportunity to fly, an opportunity to do something in the air, and I wanted it. So I worked really, really hard. They, there's uh, a set of conditioning exercises that we are required to do, and from there you um, achieve a new skill which um, actually is part of my career now. I'm a dancer, aerialist, and the same, the same story is very similar with other cast members. And what happens is that we, since we, the rotation that we, I was talking about earlier and the reblux, we have understudies. So we need everybody to be in the top shape. Um, right now, we are working on act two, which is, um, will premiere hopefully in, in about two weeks, which is the second part of Star Water, which will have some other aerial elements. And especially this week or during the crossing, you've been seeing us work a little harder. That's because we're about to get into installing a new section of the performance that's gonna happen here. And it will, it will be mostly aerial um, acts. Sorry, was there a question over here? Yep. And then I'll come. When you think of the totality of the show, uh, what is the most challenging, the most difficult aspect that you're a little nervous about getting right, and when you get it right, you say, wow. For, 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 for you, I think it's, I don't know what it is, but for me, it's the robots. I'm always, for me, I, I'm, I'm very um, impressed when the robots happen, and it, it's been a process, it's been a process of seeing these, these machines, when they, they didn't have screens, it was a wood panel. So we, we've been here since October 10th and we've been seeing them program all of that. And I, I feel like the biggest challenge is the combination of technology and, and people. Um, and I think that's the, the, the interesting blend that this performance um, experience has. Because we've danced before, we've, we've sung before, we've, we've flew before, but we never combine all those elements along with technology not just the robots, but the Vistarama. And I think that, that, that is a very fine moment that happens in the show when you see all those elements combined. And that is the challenge, to make sure that all of that is in sync. Yeah, for us, it's, uh, it's the human puppet section into the underwater sequence. If anything could happen in such a short space of time, it's that exact moment. You have four people flying individually, for which I give cues to Dorian, but then he has his own visual cues. All the time we're setting everything else up so you have the robots that come down and then go to home which is when they're in their straight vertical position there's people that disappear from these actor lifts and then there's other lifts that go down all the while i'm counting down to the robots in my head before giving other cues to everybody else to press dead mans which are local controllers to make sure that everything moves safely so those five minutes although there's a two and a half minute block where not a lot goes on it is quite a difficult section that when I begin to hand that over to someone else, that will take at least a week to make sure that they're capable of safely running through it and the confidence that you need to run the show. Yeah, I really enjoyed the show, um, but was there a specific theme or storyline or was it just more of entertainment? 
Um, yeah, there is a storyline. I, I don't know how much I want to reveal because uh, the idea is that you make up your own story. And whether you have um, an experience right here, front row or above, the show I think is meant for you to watch it more than once and keep, keep making your own story. I can tell you from my perspective and a general overview, the men belong to the air and we're thunder and we are um, high above. The women belong to the water and we have this character who is the muse played by Eileen and she is in a way um, wants to see the man and the woman combine in happiness and love and that's where you, if you see both flashes they kind of see each other and then from there on the, the guy, there's one guy that falls, right? He falls into the water and there's the story that begins there and the fusion which is the adagio that the couple do here in this area is when they combine and then from their own is a party. Hi, will this um, show be ordered for all the new ships? Sorry, what was the question? Will this show be on the new ships for Royal Caribbean? Uh, this venue will be, but it will be a different show. Also, what's the cost on one of those robots? Do you know? Yes, quite a lot. Can you tell me? <laughs> Uh, one of the robots, the actual, the arm themselves, is about sixty, sixty-four thousand dollars Okay, thank you. When you first introduced each other, you two guys said you uh, are the only ones that can run your program. What if you get sick? They're not allowed to get sick. <laughs> Answer that in a nutshell. Uh, yes, it did, I believe, me and Bruce. The ones who, we say we're not allowed to get sick, uh, when we were in the install process, we were the only ones who didn't get sick. So it's the mentality that we just, if we're not allowed to get sick, then we don't. The moment that we are allowed to get sick, I'm sure it'll be quite catastrophic. <laughs> I've seen it twice, and it's spellbinding each time because I see something different. I would like to know who came up with the original concept 270, and since that initial passage of neurons, how many people have been involved in bringing it to fruition to what we see today? That's actually a really good question. I couldn't give you a, a name on who thought this area up. Probably Harry Kulavara, uh, the VP of New Building for the company had a very large part to play in this. But it's when you start, it's when you start to think of what this area could do is when we start to add in all of the different areas. Because you have food and beverage, bar, entertainment, you have crews and activities in the library, you have IT in the computer room, the workshop. It's when we started to add all that in that more and more people would get involved. Then when it transcends into our division, which is, although entertainment, new build design it, and then we give it out to Royal Caribbean Productions, who goes to Moment Factory, and they have a team of probably at least 50 people. Uh, then you have the robotics, completely different company. You have ABB, an industrial robot company. You have Andy Robot, who designed the software that lets them do what they do. So I would say at least five to 600 people easily have an input on what this venue started as an initial drawing to what it is now. I can say that the initial drawing had non-stop glass for the whole way. It wasn't partitioned <coughs> in any way. And then someone from Marine came in and said, if we shake that with the, the force from underneath of us, you'll shatter it within an hour. So then all of the different things come in and everybody adds their own input and their own specialty. And that's how this venue becomes what it is now. I don't do conditioning, so this is my exercise. Go ahead around with the mic, this is not on mine. Um, the first impression I had walking in here was uh, I felt like being in a James Bond movie. And then you guys actually had James Bond music in the show, which was phenomenal. Um, but I know from my experience in theater that there's always something when you're putting a show together that, and this could be a different answer for every single one of you, but there's usually something that you want to do that you fall in love with that ultimately either doesn't make it in the show because it's not feasible or it just doesn't work. So I, my question is, 
Uh, was there anything for any of you guys that you fell in love with that you just couldn't make work for the show? Um, I, I can't think about anything that actually didn't didn't make it to the show. I, I want to say, related to the previous question as well, um, it was a, a work in progress, and we rehearsed on a, on a space that we only had taped. So this whole venue was taped around on the floor. We have to imagine that when I was close to there, I'm going to be dancing in, right in front of them. And as we got to, to the ship, things were added on. I don't think anything was taken out. The, the way Moment Factory worked, um, and their planning at least for the artistic part of it, was very, were very spot on, I have to say. Um, I believe perhaps changes for the music, the, the musical elements, if I, I don't know, Aileen, if you want to expand on that. The music changed a few times throughout. Um, even during rehearsals, when we were in rehearsal, we would, the other two girls, one of the girls isn't here, to, um, here right now, but she'll be back, so we have three singers. Um, and so the three of us were in rehearsal, and one, you know, the first couple of days we learned some things, and then the next day we would come and they go, okay, we're changing that. And so they would change it and we'd have to, we learned it or we added harmonies or took things out or at one point I was supposed to sing Roxanne and then they decided that to have my voice do that all the time would probably be a little bit damaging so they left it that you know that Roxanne was the, that version um, there, so there, things like that changed uh, for us musically even right up we were, Bruce and I were talking that right up until the very end there was some things that changed in the music so even opening night the girls and I were downstairs going I never heard that before like there were things that we hadn't even heard because right up until opening night things were changing in the music so there, for us there was a lot of change so we had to be very very adaptable throughout the rehearsal process because things for us did change very very frequently sometimes day to day uh, things changed for us as uh, for the three singers what special conversations do you have to make for ship movement and rough seas we, we actually um, had a meeting about it, and we have um, we have a plan if there's no, if, if it's too rocky. Yeah, there are a couple different versions of the flying that we can do depending on the severity of the motion. Uh, one of the first things we actually end up cutting would be the cello flight, um, because he's up there for so long. So sometimes we may not have the cello. Uh, if the weather is a little bit worse than that, then we might cut some of the puppets or even perhaps the adagio that the couple does. Um, unfortunately for Eileen, she is the safest one in the dress right here, so she will probably always be in the show. And, and for the dancers, we different things like when we're walking, instead of having the leg in the air, we just have it in the floor. Instead of doing an overhead lift, we just have a different version of a lift that is safer. I just wanted to know, what is your next show? <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> what time? 10.20, right? Tomorrow, 10.20. Thank you. Yes. Okay, anybody else? Um, kind of going along uh, with the accounting for the rocking of the boat, is there any time where you can't have the robot screens operational because of the boat moving? No, unfortunately I have to run them all the time. Uh, they will shake, but the way that we program them is they have at least a 20 millimeter gap between them at all points, so the vibration isn't really enough. If it gets to that point, I would think uh, it would more be a case that we wouldn't have many people here to watch them due to seasickness than them not being able to run. I've seen approximately around 30 rock, uh, Caribbean production shows. Well, this is by far the best I've ever seen, so thank you for that experience. Um, and I don't care about if any technical things are not working on a ship being three weeks old, so I think that's what everybody should expect and not complain about. And by the way, you're improving every night, so I've seen the show now fifth, five times, six times, I don't know, and I'm, I'm still working on the number. Um, two questions. First of all, why is the uh, left rubber screen a bit thicker than all the other fives? And, and a question to all the other guys, uh, how did you get your contract? Did Royal Caribbean ask you to do this and they selected you? Um, or did you ask for coming to the front of the seas? We broke it. 
Uh, yeah, there was a, when we're programming them, they, we have to start at a very slow speed. So we start at 10% and we increment through that up until we reach 100%. But it will throw out different faults each time. Basically, you have a number of errors that the robot can give, collision errors, if it hits something, which it did. Uh, joint tolerance errors, if you imagine moving any of those screens from left to right at half a meter per second, and then instantly going from right to left at one meter per second, at 50%, that might work. At 90%, it throws it too hard, and if the ship lists just enough, then it becomes too much pressure on that single joint, so it falls out, and then something else might not fall out, and then it runs into <coughs> itself. So the reason it's thicker is because it was a, a rush-ordered older model, so we're able to continue doing the show. Basically, we were one robot down, so we called the show Tar Water, because it was missing the S from the start. <laughs> that was for a period of like five days. Um, as far as the contract, I don't know how it works with the technicians, but the dancers and the vocalists and the cellists we were um, selected among thousands of people that submitted their materials. They did hold auditions throughout New York, um, not New York, just the United States, different cities, and they were receiving a lot of submissions via videos. And the cast right now is like half veterans, people that worked before with Royal Caribbean, and half new hires. But all of us, even the ones that have been with the company for 11 contracts, they had to submit a video. And in this video, they were very specific with the things that they were asking. And you have to introduce yourself and say why you want to be part of, part of the show. And um, Eileen can speak about her experience, because she wasn't going to do it. And then she submitted the video last minute. I didn't know what it was. And I was on another ship. I was on the Brilliance of the Seas at the time. And the um, vocal director from our studios in Hollywood, Florida, sent me an email and said, I need you to record yourself singing this song, this song, and this song. And I was like, okay. I said, okay, and then I didn't do it. And then he sent me another email. He said, didn't you get my email saying I need you to do this, this, and this? And I um, prepared to do it, and some things didn't work out. And I had a couple of friends on my ship that said, if we have to go into a bathroom, you're going to record this stuff and send it. So the only place that I could find on the ship at the time, it was 1 o'clock in the morning, and I went up to Giovanni's which is one of the restaurants on the Brilliance, and we moved some tables around, and I recorded my video with my friend playing on his iPad, <laughs> and I sent it in, I sent my video in, and two days later they said, congratulations, you're a part of the cast of Star Water, and I said, oh, that's nice, what is that? And then <laughs> I had no idea anything, absolutely no idea, until I got to rehearsals and met the most amazing people, um, and I was like, why did they pick me to do this? I, I was so honored, I, I could not believe it. I, I cried for probably the first three or four days. Yeah, because I was so honored to be a part of something so new and, and different and exciting, and then they put me in a harness, <laughs> blew me up in the air and said, sing. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> and Dorian and I, and there were a few other riggers there, so that was a bit of a process. So it was, it was like that for, for me and one of the other singers as well. Same thing for um, Jacqueline, the other, one of the other singers. They did the same thing. She got the request to send a video, and we didn't even know each other at the time, but we both did the same thing. Neither one of us sent it, and then we got a you know, second request. It's like, send it. So I think they kind of knew they wanted us, or they wanted Moment Factory to see what we had to offer. And fortunately for me and Jacqueline and all the rest of us, Moment Factory liked what they saw and the 16 people that they put together. I, I mean, I think that I'm blessed to have this job and be working with some of the most amazing people. And, you know, the, the sounds, the lights, the rigging, the, you know, our production manager, everything about this is incredible. I, sometimes I get lost in the moment and I'm looking at my skirt and just thinking of how amazing it looks behind me. And it's, it's wonderful, it's a wonderful experience. I'm glad I sent my video. I have to say that one of the things that the director, um, I was actually working in one of the auditions in New York City. I was assisting the casting director and the director of the show. And she actually didn't pick anybody in New York. She said that she's looking for some people that are generous. So they were absolutely amazing dancers who are actually on other ships at the moment that I met them. Actually, one of them is uh, one of the dancers in the Mamma Mia cast. So she didn't make it here. The directors from Moment Factory they were, were very specific. We, they look for very different individuals 
that were strong in personality and in, in their artistry. So I think you ended up with a unlikely group that is, is very, very special. And they left us about two weeks ago when they said they, they cannot imagine the show now without the muse being Eileen or without the couples that they are right now. much of a maze looking at it from here and it's a maze up there because as Bruce is saying we have speakers we have lights we have you know I mean that you have to think up there they have the, the fire mister things I have to watch my head all the time because they have exit signs there's so much up there and I'm actually climbing up and over through like little rat holes just to yeah I am I'm doing that's what I'm doing yeah <laughs> With a big, with the crown on. Yeah, yeah. That's, yes. I Is come out Dick, Dick and I appear Dick right Dick here. I, um, there's, I come out up there. So how do I get there? I don't even know how I get there, but I end up over there to, and I have to put on clothes because clearly everything is stripped off up there. So I don't know how much you saw, but <laughs> welcome to the show. So <laughs> Deck seven and this is deck three. Uh, all the base like is four there. and a half. The door is deck five, deck six, and then the grid is deck seven. Yeah. So there are staircases for the crew only. Don't try to get in there. And that's how we come up through this section. There's also a staircase down here, and obviously we use the actors' lift and the stage piano and stage lift to come up. up. Okay. A few final questions for anyone. One name. I just have one question. The show is fantastic. Why don't you do the credits at the end so we know who the dancers are and uh, get the credit? We don't know how to do it yet. <laughs> We're still working out what to say and when. Uh, we all have recordings of the show and we're literally watching who's bowing and when. The weirdest thing is, it's, and give it up for the robot screens. But you say it as if they're the last thing to bow, but if you actually watch the show, in terms of the sequence, they're the first thing to bow. So we need to work out how to say and what to say and when. It is a work in progress, and hopefully in a few weeks we'll have it, along with our pre-show announcements and whatnot. But yeah, it's, it's trouble because we don't know how to say it and what to say, because from what I can see, the dancers all bow at once. Then Eileen, the muse, the cellist, the featured characters, do you call them featured characters or what, what do we say is kind of the problem that we're having at the moment. But it is, it will be there eventually because they do deserve recognition and their name to be said over the speakers. Yes, absolutely, he is. Unfortunately, he's stuck two meters down in a tube and can't see who's going where. So usually they would have a camera view or something to be able to see who's doing what, but I have to relay that information to a stage staff who then relays it to him while he's stuck in a torpedo tube. So, we're working it out. Are the robots custom or are they industrial robots? Also, what type of software are they? Uh, they're industrial robots made by ABB. Uh, they come from their factory in Detroit. Uh, they're running a mixture of software, so usually they run their robot studio, which is a way of inputting information into them to tell them what to do. But Andy Robot's company use a software called Maya, which is a graphic representation, I believe, and it can program them to what, what they're meant to do. But then on here, we have it running through our show automation system, which is designed by an Austrian company called Wagner Biro. So all the stage automation in the theater 
and in here is controlled by the same system, and they created software that allows it to talk between all three. Or physically, are the projectors for the Vista screens? So, uh, you see this wooden panel that runs the <coughs> whole way, and then behind the robots, and then the other side, just where the curtain ends. If you walk on that carpet and look up there, you'll see 18 projectors. How many different pictures do you have that show on the Vista screen? Not for, not for the show, but just Six. I want to say six. Again, we're still in the early stages. We haven't actually tested all of them fully. Tonight we'll be running, well, tonight at seven o'clock onwards, we'll have the Vista Rama in, and we'll be running different things. We'll have our Impossible City, a one called Live Art. Obviously, you've seen the red curtain. There's a kid's one called Ocean Symphony. There's various ones we can do. We're just trying to work out how to map it all into the program. Because what we never want to do is obstruct this view. If it's a horrible day outside, what we like to say is if you don't like the view, we can change it for you. So we're working on that, but unfortunately it's not been a horrible day yet. And I mean that in a sarcastic tone. I had uh, two questions. The first one is that wall underneath the rails, it looks like it's perforated or something. Is there something behind that? Just like are there subwoofers down there? Or? Got it in one. Subwoofers. Cool. Second thing is, there's a port on that second one. Is that also for speakers, or is there is it pump pumping like wind or something? We get to let the light talk talk. <laughs> yeah, finally. No, it's a, there's a smoke machine there. Uh, you see it featured, uh, I believe, once or maybe twice in the show. Uh, at the the Skyfall section, you'll see there's a bunch of smoke that comes out, and that's that's what that was for. Gotcha. And then when you're out there with the huge dress thing, is there fans underneath kind of blowing that up, or is that just all from you guys fan there? The it's, uh, yeah, we have uh, two, two people per panel, so six. They tried fans. That's an interesting question. They were trying not to get us to do it, but they said the only way that it looks right is if you actually have people. So you see, technology cannot always replace people. <laughs> and uh, you'll notice that for the, uh, the Adagio section, the few times when we have a silk over here, there is a fan that actually blows it to get the shape. And two people holding it. Yes. <laughs> it's the combination of technology and people. Okay, so we'll finish out with maybe one more question. Unfortunately, I'm going to run up there and get the screen set so we can show you one of our robot capsules. So you're more than welcome to stay for that. Uh, I will pass the microphone over and then disappear very awkwardly up these stairs. <laughs> stage age or my real age? <laughs> no, um, I'm 35. Um, I've been working in the industry, not on cruise lines, but I've been working in the audio industry for probably the last 12 years now. Um, I actually have a bachelor's degree in um, audio engineering. Um, yeah, I've just decided to take this job to travel. It's, it's a good way to earn your money, you know, you get to see a different place every day. You work very hard, but even in this industry on land, you're probably going to clock the same amount of hours. You know, the, the plus side is, is that um, unlike touring, which basically this is what the gig is for me, um, I don't have to build a sound system every day, I don't have to change it to suit a different room. It's, it's a good combination of, of both for me. Uh, I'm 27. I went to elementary school. Middle school, high school, graduated from all of those, and then went to undergrad at University of Southern or, or sorry, Southern Oregon University to get my bachelor's in scenic technology management. And then I got my master's immediately thereafter at the University of Texas at Austin in the same field. And I've been like a carpenter and a welder prior to that since I was about ten or eleven. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I am twenty-five. I've been working in theater. Since about 2008-ish, and just doing various stuff. I used to live in the D.C. area, so I did theater there, moved to New York. I've been doing all over the place. I did go to school for lighting and technical theater, so uh, that's my 
my background. I've been working with Royal Caribbean only since July. Uh, and I've been transferred a few times. I actually was not involved with the install of this show. That was our previous flight tech, Dan, who has now gone on vacation. So I've only actually been on this ship for two and a half weeks, two weeks, something like that. So it's all pretty new to me as well. But uh, I'm learning it pretty quickly. Um, I'm 15. <laughs> and uh, actually, the cast, um, the youngest one, I believe she's 20. And I'm the oldest one, I'm 31. And yes, it's true. And um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I moved to New York when I was 17. And I um, have a degree, a BFA in dance, and been working around. So Javier just lied. He is not the oldest one. I am. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> I don't mind. I am proud. I am a proud 47 year old grandmother of two. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and that is the truth. Um, my degree is in elementary education, actually. Um, I didn't start performing until 2006 when my children were older. I have a 24-year-old daughter and a 22-year-old son. Um, and I started performing when they were older. I just did it as kind of like a sideline. Like a, uh, I did some community theater just as a hobby to have something to do to kind of fill my time as my children were getting older. And then someone said, you need to audition at Bush Gardens in Tampa. And I was a head teller at a credit union at the time on a fast track. And um, then I went to work for Progressive Insurance. And um, I guess I should have been Flo, but <laughs> there's that job. Um, so yeah, I was working at Progressive Insurance and I decided that on my days off, I would go play at a theme park and sing. And I had fun and they offered me a full-time job and I said no because at Progressive I had 401k, I had medical, dental, and full vision. And then Bush Garden said, we offer that same thing. And I said, well, thank you for the job. So I moved over to singing in 2006 and I started doing ships when um, the show that I was in, the contract ended, the show closed. And in 2011 I did my first cruise ship and so I've been doing that ever since. <coughs> I'm 28. Me and Bruce went to college when we were, uh, we both studied audio engineering. Uh, so we've known each other for, gosh, 10 years now? See, very unrehearsed. So very unrehearsed and honest this session. Uh, yeah, we went to college together in Scotland and I studied audio electronics with engineering. Sorry, audio engineering with electronics in Glasgow. From there I worked as a local roadie in Glasgow at various open air concerts, in-house concerts doing the exact thing that Bruce said he didn't like doing, building speakers every day and lighting rigs and whatnot. And then I joined Royal Caribbean in 2009 as a stage staff, then a rigging specialist, and then production manager of the Aqua Theatres on Oasis and Allure. Then I was selected to come here, and I'll be doing the, I'll be here until January, I've been here since August, and then I'll be doing the anthem next as well. Yeah. And this is right here, the gentleman in the lovely lavender shirt, this is one of our dancers. This is Fabio. If you saw the show, he was one of the featured areas here. So this is Fabio. He came to pop in to watch, and now I put him on the spot. <laughs> so if there are no further questions, uh, I'd like to let the guys go. We'll run a robot show for you as well, so you can see basically all the important things that I get to do. And we'd like to thank you for coming out. We have Vistarama Exposition this evening from 7 until 11 where you can see some of the sequences we haven't shown you yet, and then we have our final production of Star Water tomorrow at 10.20. So thanks very much for everyone coming along. Have a good day.
thank you very much everyone for coming to the 270 Technology Tour. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the presentation and enjoy the rest of your day on board Quantum of the Sea. Very cool. I didn't sit back uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. I wonder how many channels the sound they use. No, no idea. I bet there's a lot. They do it by one in the back. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> when there's nobody clapping. I don't think I've really seen yeah. it. I saw something. Yeah. It's a lot of neat stuff, that's for sure. Yeah. 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 I don't what you're playing with. There are more cameras. Well, we have to go 3.30. Let's, uh, 3.30. Yeah, we have to change yeah. the dinner. Huh? Can I just swim on? More cameras. Just like these. They just swim on the wall. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y